I believe we're on the air. Hi, I'm Stuart Reed. I'm the Executive Director of Food Co-op Initiative and welcome today to our presentation on sizes of co-ops, how to find the right size store for your community, one that can be successful and meet their needs. And we're going to take a look at our, our, some of the wisdom of the ages from Goldilocks and a few of her friends to help us along the way. This is one of a series of webinars presented by Food Co-op Initiative. We hope you've enjoyed them so far. We'll have more coming every month, all year. Please sign up for as many as you'd like. And if you missed part of it or some of your uh, organizing team can't be here today, these webinars are recorded and will be available through links on our website. And you can watch them at your convenience or rewatch them at your convenience. So uh, with no further ado, uh, we'll get started on today's presentation. Uh, Rosie, can we advance the slide? Okay. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, in the world of fairy tales, what should you believe? Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there about co-ops and co-op size. So that's our once upon a time section. Then we're going to move on to Goldilocks and uh, the three bears and find out what they have to tell us about too big, too small, and just right. Um, and threes are, seem to be a theme in fairy tales, but we're going to go on to the three little pigs and think about uh, houses of straw, stick, and stone. And of course, no fairy tale story would be complete without a moral. And uh, hopefully by the time we're done, everybody will be ready to live happily ever after. So this is what we're after today. And as we go through the agenda, be sure to post any questions you have. Uh, we have people watching for those, and if they're appropriate during the, during the presentation, we'll, we'll cut in and answer a few questions. Or we'll have a section at the end as well for anything that you haven't had a chance to ask before that. So uh, please keep track of your questions or ask them as they come up. No problem. Okay, let's go on and start the conversation. There we go. So first off, some myths and misconceptions. We are in the beginning of a really big wave of new co-op development. And a lot of the people that are interested in new co-op development have been around in previous waves of co-op development. And things have changed quite a bit, uh, some for the better, some making our job a lot harder. But nonetheless, we have to be careful that some of the things that seem like they worked so well 40 years ago uh, may or may not be the right things in this current environment. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that right here. But um, first off, the idea that co-ops can start small and grow. Yes, of course they can. Have they always? Not always. But uh, most of the last wave of co-ops did start very small. But they were in a very different environment. There was very little competition. There was far fewer natural food goods to even put on the shelf. And uh, they were being started by, by and for a very core community of hardcore shoppers and supporters that could keep it running on volunteer power and uh, hand to mouth a lot of times. And that, that model isn't very effective anymore. In fact, a lot of co-ops that have tried to continue to use that have discovered that they're struggling to survive. So uh, can co-ops start small? Yes. Growth is harder, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, unfortunately, this is a very idealistic kind of uh, enterprise we're in. We're, we're very committed to what we do, and we believe in it wholeheartedly. But you have to keep track of that idealism, because it is not true that just because you're a co-op, you will find the support you need. You have to earn it, and you have to build it, and uh, you have to provide what people are looking for. So. Uh, Practicality has to temper your idealism a little bit. Not that we don't love idealism, we do. So small stores actually may require more effort than a large store to be successful in putting it together at the beginning. You know, it seems logical that a small store, oh, we can do things quicker. We can don't have to be as careful about some of the uh, testing of theories and business plans and the financials and all that. It can be a little looser as it's a small store. It won't matter. Well, unfortunately, it's almost exactly the opposite because the smaller the store, the tighter 
the requirements that, are, that need to be met in order for it to be successful. So it's very, very important if you're starting small to be very to have good planning and good financial projections. Uh, big stores are a bigger risk. They they risk more money, but in terms of the overall risk of being a successful business, not so true. Big stores are generally successful and have a little more leeway to to learn and grow within their uh, starting steps, if you will. So uh, finally, there's this very, very common concern, if not a misconception, that if the project has been going on for a while and people have invested their money, that you have to give them something to show for that or they will, they're going to give up on you and run away. Well, it's not true. It's not true if you handle it right. You need to be always communicating with your members, telling them why things take so long, and explaining what you're doing. Even if it's going slow, talk to us. And keep in mind that there have been stores that have taken 10 years to organize that are tremendously successful and that their members did not abandon them. So uh, we know that for sure that you can keep them on board for a long time. And giving up on a good plan early is not necessarily uh, a good idea. OK, those are a few. Well, let's go on to the next slide. And here's a few other thoughts about the grocery business that aren't always apparent to people and that do influence the size of a store and, and why certain sizes matter. Grocery stores in general, and while we may be a different and very special kind of grocery store, we're still in the grocery store industry, have a very low profit margin. And I'm talking 2% would be considered, bottom line profit would be considered good by a lot of the mainstream grocery industry. If you're getting up into the 4% range, it's stellar. So every penny out of the dollar is a difference between that 1% or 2% extra profit, and it's very, very tight. And your competitors, and again, our co-op, our competitors, who are they? Well, everybody out there that's selling grocery is a competitor to some extent. Some competitors are much more critical to you than others. Um, you know, a Whole Foods store nearby is probably going to have a bigger impact than Trader Joe's and certainly a bigger impact than a dollar store. But uh, again, depending on how each of those stores chooses to provide natural foods and the same products you provide will impact your store. And especially if you've got a, a really good smaller competitor in the market that pays attention to customer service, uh, has knowledgeable staff, creative merchandising, they could be a, a stronger competitor than Walmart. So you have to pay attention to those people. And you know that they're, uh, the big stores, almost all of them, are buying state-of-the-art equipment. They're going to have a computer system and a point-of-sale system that tracks every sale, every customer, uh, annual purchases. It can tell them what products are selling well, which ones aren't. You need that same kind of information to be competitive. They're going to invest a lot in merchandising, making their store look good. That includes decor. That's part of merchandising and part of the reason why you want good equipment in the store. And in their promotional budget. So all of those things is what your competitors will be doing. And if you aren't planning to do those as well, you're going to have some, some issues there. You're giving up some of the business or even worse, uh, losing business completely to competitors that do it better. So to get those cents on the dollar, you have to be in that game. And the biggest problem for, for us as smaller stores, and frankly, even the largest food co-ops would be considered small stores in the grocery industry, where big box stores are the norm, and even large supermarkets are probably 40,000 square feet more often than not. So economies of scale, it becomes a very big concern. Uh, within the natural foods industry, we're closer to scale. The stores tend to be somewhat smaller, and our purchasing power isn't as divergent as it would be if we were buying conventional groceries, and some co-ops do buy conventional groceries. But the discounts that you might see based on the volume of purchase from UNFI, as an example, the primary natural foods distributor, using uh, contract pricing, they're selling to 
NCGA stores on a, what's called a cost plus contract. And the costs are defined as the costs that they pay for the goods plus ship incoming freight and a few other things, which aren't important at the moment. But a really strong, a really big customer will have a cost plus only a few percents, up to maybe 7%. A smaller customer will be paying cost plus 14. Seven percentage points difference in your cost of goods. And that, if that doesn't seem like a lot, believe me, it is. So that's only one example. Almost all of the grocery distributors are basing their pricing on volume. So the larger stores have a huge advantage on their ability to sell goods at a lower cost. And that last point, I'm just throw it up there because it's a very big disappointment to almost everybody. And you can change the silk and you can change Walmart to whatever brands and stores you want. But all of you are going to go out there at some point to a big box store and find something on the shelf being sold for 10 cents less than you can buy it. It's just that is one of the realities of our lives as small independent stores compared to huge chains. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Come along now. Beep. Next slide. <laughs> Are we stuck or is my screen Sir, you, responding? You have the next slide. You're just not seeing them. Ah, thank you for They're that. Okay. Don't worry. Thank you. All right. So we talk to ourselves when we do this. Um, the next slide is Goldilocks. We're finally getting around to our, our real fairy tale characters. And uh, you know, the, when you're talking about store size, Goldilocks has the right idea. Check them all out. You know, is this one too big? Is this one too small? And is this one just right? Well, how do you know until you test fit? So take a look at what's out there. Look at other stores of different sizes. See what they're doing. Ask them how happy they are with what they can do. Think about what the implications are, and we'll talk a little bit more about those different size implications. But uh, I had to throw in avoid angry bears. I'm not quite sure what the analogy is, but it's always a good idea. Okay. Next slide, whether I can see it or not. Uh, there we go. So let's start with the too small, because usually this is the concern. Frankly, there are a lot of startups that are looking at store sizes that are small for a variety of reasons, usually because they think it'll be easier to open, it'll be easier to get enough members, enough capital, uh, find a space, all kinds of reasons why it might seem easier to open a small store. And some of them are legitimate. And of course, it's easier to find, get a smaller number of members, raise a smaller amount of capital. But the, what was, will that small store do if it's too small? Now, I'm not saying that all small stores are too small. But if it is too small, you're going to have to look at a real difficulty in paying the bills because some of the expenses of running a grocery store are fairly set. And a small store will have higher uh, amount of expenses compared to its revenue than a large store will. So the percentage of sales dedicated to paying rent, to paying for licensing, for paying insurance, some of those things aren't going to change dramatically as a store gets bigger. But you're going to have almost all of the same expenses to some degree. Okay. Something you might not think about, but in, as a, if the store is too small to be an NCGA member, it means that you won't have access to some of those service contracts and to the UNFI cost of goods contract, to the promotional programs they offer, and the wonderful support programs they offer to their members. It's a very big uh, advantage for any new co-op to be able to use that those services. Um, the, the qualifications for membership uh, change a little bit, and they're not set in stone. But generally speaking, you're going to need to have sales in the range of $2 million a year uh, to start being considered for an NCGA membership. So if you're planning a store smaller than that, you're going to have to plan for not having those access to those things. Uh, there's also some limitation in what you can do in meeting your community's needs in a smaller store. Clearly, a small store means not as many products, less diversity. Some kinds of departments probably won't be there at all. Like, you know, you probably won't be doing a lot of in-house bakery or uh, maybe not even be able to fit in Delhi in a 1,000-square-foot store. So 
things to think about. What is it your community wants? Can you meet those needs? And this one is, I think, a really good case in point. The perishable products, which are typically what most of the local food is, your produce, your eggs, cheese, meat, all of the things that you want to uh, buy from local producers as part of your mission to support the local economy, and it's what your customers are asking for, it's very hard in a small store because those are perishable products you know, have to have good display space and you have to have storage space as well. And refrigerated space, of course, is some of your most expensive equipment and takes up a lot of room. And the other piece of that is that in a smaller store with lower sales volume, it doesn't turn over as fast and you will have higher spoilage rates and lose margin on them. It, that's almost inevitable. Very careful management can alleviate some of that, but be prepared to make for a hard, much harder uh, selling job of perishable products and local foods in a very small space, a too small space. Okay. So very small stores also are susceptible to competition in ways other than just the lack of variety. If there is an untapped market for natural foods and your store is only meeting a small part of that, a competitor is likely to eventually come in to fill that gap. You know, if you've got a store that's the right size to meet the needs of your community, then there isn't a lot of leftovers for some competitor to come in after. It, it doesn't guarantee they won't, but it certainly is helpful. And then again, very small stores that are looking at that misconception that they're going to use that as a launching pad to their bigger store that they really want should consider carefully that in a very small store, even if it's profitable, the amount of money you're going to be able to set aside for future growth is relatively small. And I don't want to bury people in numbers, but if you are interested in it, I'm going to run through the scenario very quickly and we'd be happy to answer questions about it later. So for example, but this is our too small store for this community. It's a thousand square feet of retail space. Uh, we see some that are smaller than that, but a thousand square feet is toward the low end. Now, if you're doing very well on your sales, and I do mean very well, it would be above average, you might do $500 a square foot on an annual basis, which would give you a $500,000 annual revenue. With me so far? So far, so good. All right. Typically, a cost of goods in a small store or in any co-op, they tend to be fairly similar, is around 65% of sales, or in other words, 35% gross margin. And on $500,000 in annual sales, that would leave you with, after paying for your food, $175,000 to do with everything else. That's your, your rent, your insurance, your, your utilities, your payroll, everything. And that's about just $14,500 a month to cover it. Okay? Now, maybe you have very low overhead, you very low labor costs, and you can do that. Great. Then you're doing very well. So let's say that this store is making those payments. It's in line with it. And it's very successful for a small store, and it has a 2% net profit at the end of the year. Okay? That 2% net profit is $10,000. Now, how many years of profit at $10,000 is it going to take to accumulate capital to move into a larger store? It's a reasonable question to ask yourselves. If you're not going to be able to build capital in the small store, if that was your goal, then you need to look at a different goal. 50 new members investing $200 a piece is $10,000. You might be able to do that in three months. And uh, just there's other ways to do it. So. That's the most I'm going to go deep into the weeds and numbers with you today. So thanks for sticking with me. Uh, and that's why that last point is there. Future expansion will look a lot like starting over because basically you're going to have to plan for a new store. You're going to have to raise all the capital for that. You're going to have to do, do a complete new business plan. and. Uh, so down the road, you're going to you're going to end up eventually starting a, a co-op twice if you do grow into a larger space. All right, that's an optimistic view, isn't it? 
let's start to the next slide. So what happens if your co-op is too big? Uh, well, I'm going to start at the bottom and say these are very rare. Uh, because of it costs a lot to open a large store and because it takes a long time to put together a very large member base to support that store, we very rarely have a situation where a new co-op opens with a too big space. So frankly, I wouldn't worry too much about it. Um, I don't think it's a problem most of you will face. But what would happen is that you're going to have a store that is, you can't keep full. It'll look empty and feel empty. And if a store starts looking and feeling empty, pretty soon it will be because customers think, oh, this store looks like it's not doing well. It's going out of business. Their shelves aren't full. Uh, they're afraid that the goods are old. Uh, in any case, they very rarely survive for very long. And the, the reason that a too big store will bring you down quickly is that you have very high overhead costs to go with a very large store, but your sales volume isn't up to that space. You aren't going to cover those costs. And you're in trouble. Okay. I'm gonna let's see a too big. Oh, let's do just right, and then I'm gonna pause just a minute for some uh, first round of questions. So one more slide here. Alrighty, uh, I'm lost track. Here we go. So a just right store. What does it look like? And you'll notice here that. I haven't said a specific size for Just Right, because Just Right isn't the same for every community. Some stores are smaller, some are larger, and that's really the biggest point of this whole discussion. There is not a magic number, a square feet, foot, feet, that says this is just right for a co-op. We do know that co-ops tend to be a lot more successful if they have at least 3,000 square feet of floor space, but there's no exact number. So a just right store, what does it look like? You have what you need to meet your market's needs. Co-ops exist to meet an unmet need. That is not a co-op principle, but it is a truth, truthful statement about most co-ops. So if you can't meet the needs of your community with what you've done in your store, it's unlikely that you will be as successful as you should be. So space issues are not just inventory. They're also the ability of the staff to do their job easy, relatively easily, as easily as it can be done, efficiently. They're not stumbling all over themselves. They're not moving things from the basement to the uh, upstairs or, or having to stock the shelves 20 times a day because you have no backstock. All of these things make a big difference in the efficiency of your labor and in the shopping experience for your customers. You should have a store that when you open isn't overly large, but it should not be at the minimum size needed for your sales either, so that you're not growing out of it right away. In other words, if you've gotten a good sales projection before you've chosen your site, you'll know what your first year potential sales are, and you'll know what your sales at maturity, usually a few years later when growth is primarily coming from uh, changes in cost of living and changes that you make within the store rather than just new customers finding you for the first time. So you want to plan for the store that will meet the needs of your store at maturity uh, and hopefully when you do your sale projections you'll get to that point soon enough that before you're at that sales level the lower sales levels are still sufficient to support your expenses and keep you viable. That's a balancing act. Stuart, um, how much size do you need for back stock? How much for back stock? Well, a typical store uh, will use about a third of its total gross square footage for offices, back stock, and everything other than retail space. Now, a store that wants to have a large community room or um, a, a very large deli might need more back room space than, than a so-called typical store, but uh, generally we allow, planners will allow for about uh, one-third of the space in back, two-thirds of the space for actual retail. Okay, and finally here, let's see, where are we at? Uh, yeah, you've got to have enough sales, we talked about that a little bit, but the bottom line, and really important, 
Store size should not be an emotional decision. It shouldn't be, oh, we want a cute little store and there's an empty building that'll just fit in there and oh my, my let's just do it. No, please. It's a business decision. This is you're investing even in a very small store, you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars probably to get it open, either in kind or actual cash. And in larger stores, it's millions of dollars. It deserves very careful planning and thoughtfulness. It's a business decision based on hard numbers and analysis. But yes, your vision is also important. What is your store going to be in your community? It has a big role in it. It's not just the other numbers. But you have to validate your vision and your decision on what you're going to do for a store size with analysis. So, all right. We're gone through the too big, too small, and just right sizes. Um, do we have any other questions waiting in line? I think we might have lost a voice. Oh, sorry about that. Stuart, we don't have any more questions right now. I guess you're doing such a great job. Uh, either that or everybody's gone to sleep already. Okay. Uh, please, we welcome the questions. So keep them coming. And we'll keep moving until we get them. All right. So we've got Goldilocks. Where would we be without porridge? Um, I didn't know what else to call this. But here are some examples of stores. Uh, they're all relatively small stores, or were at least at one time. Uh, and to just give an example of what that has meant for them, they're all stores that I would consider currently successful, although not necessarily wildly successful at this point. And uh, there are three stores that uh, have different lengths of existence, different histories, very different in many ways. Yelm Fu Co-op is one of the newer ones. It's one we worked with a, a while back in a smaller community in Yelm, Washington. Uh, Spiral Net Foods is just down the road from me in Minnesota. It's been around for a long time in a medium, small, semi-rural community. And Common Ground is in an urban location with the two cities that make up Champaign-Urbana combining to be over 120,000 people. Okay, so a little variety for you. And let's take a look at each one of those just briefly. Yelm Food Co-op. Small community by the standards of most co-ops. 7,000 is a small population to support a co-op. They opened the co-op with 1,000 square feet in 2007. This is the picture on the left is the way it looked originally, and the picture on the right, I believe, is the same building after they've done some remodeling a few years down the road from when they opened. Uh, the market area for a small community like this, unless it's connected to a lot of other co or a lot of other cities nearby, is typically pretty small. And a smaller co-op is probably the only real viable choice they had if they wanted a retail outlet. And they put this together with uh, almost no debt. Uh, it was almost all paid up front in cash, which is a goal of that particular operating group. And it's a difficult goal to meet, by the way, and not necessarily one I'm recommending. But, uh, because what they did have when they opened was a limited amount of equipment, particularly refrigeration equipment, and they had no paid staff, and they had no leeway to acquire things or to deal with any emergencies that might come up. They were pretty much reliant on a fairly small core of volunteers to keep the store open, and they were only op able to be open a relatively small number of hours. But they did have that dedicated core, and they achieved reasonable sales volume of $400,000 for a 1,000-square-foot store. $400 a square foot is where we would say um, first year in most stores, that would be the low end of what we would consider desirable acceptable. Now, they moved doubled that, more than doubled that, in, uh, although it has been a few years. It's not like it happened overnight. In six years, uh, they're now up to a little under a million dollars. Um, they have, I believe it's been changing depending on who was available and what their budget looked like, but I think they have one full-time person managing the store and coordinating volunteer work. Uh, and they have 
modestly regular business hours. So they have not grown in space. They haven't moved. Uh, they have grown in sales volume, and right now, $912 a square foot on an annual basis is very respectable. Um, I do know from talking to some of the organizers that as early as their second year, they wished they had done something bigger, um, and they're still working toward that goal. So that's that's the story of one small co-op that's existing and, and so far doing a pretty good job out there. Now let's look at Spiral Natural Foods. Spiral is a little bigger store, and this is a very unusual example in some ways in that they they moved three times all within their downtown of their uh, com community, uh, opening the first store in 1979 and landing eventually in a 3,100 square foot of retail space where they were doing $400,000 $400, a year. Now that's only $127 per square foot on an annual basis, which is far below what is normally considered survivable even. Uh, they had been in business for quite a long time. They had been fairly stagnant. Uh, $400,000 is a very small store by anybody's standards. And it isn't because the space in the store is necessarily that small. For some reason, the store was underperforming in its space. And there was a variety of reasons, perhaps, that we could attribute to it. Some of them were um, some of the policies and uh, membership structure that were in place from the early years that hadn't ever been changed that tended to be a disincentive to people. Uh, but part of it was also clearly that the site was not appropriate. Uh, Space-wise, it might have been, but not location-wise. So they moved into a new store. I think they lost. They had to move. I think they were in a position where they were going to lose the other space. It had to do a fairly urgent campaign. They uh, moved in 2011, and this is the really unusual part. It's very rare that a store moves into a smaller space. Uh, they did. They dropped down to a little less than 2,000 square feet of retail space. And you know, if you looked at their previous sales volume, that would be much more appropriate. But the other thing that happened was almost immediately, in the first year in that space, their volume almost doubled in a little more than half the space. Pointing to the fact that appropriate size is part of it, of course, but one other factor that we haven't really talked about is how important location is in site. And that, that was probably the main difference in this new store. This year they're expecting to hit a million dollars. Uh, which is a very respectable sales per square foot number, and uh, they seem to be doing quite well. Now, they attribute some of their success not only to the better site, but also to using best practices. They, they invested quite a bit of money and really a lot of their own energy and effort in changing their store culture, changing some of the relationship they had with their owner members in the community, bringing in new owner investment, new equity, and uh, building up, you know, improving the store by better, better equipment and fixtures uh, and getting training for people. So they invested a lot in making this transition. And uh, some of the aspects of the spiral foods, we're going to talk to um, the three little pigs about in a little bit. Stuart, we had just a couple questions here. Mm -hmm. um, guys, this is an unusual store. <laughs> How many paid employees did Spiral have upon opening? Uh, in the new store? or the uh, Well, actually, I don't know the answer to either. I'm sorry. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a relatively small staff, um, and I believe that at least since they moved into the new store, it's entirely a paid staff. I, don't, I think probably in the old store, almost all of the stores in the, in the 70s and 80s were using some volunteerism. I, I don't know how long that continued at Hastings. Okay, and do you know how many members um, each of these stores had at opening? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, I will not be held to this, but I believe that Yelm had in the range of a few hundred, maybe three to four hundred at opening, and I think there were probably over a thousand now. Um, they had, the Spiral store had under 100 members. They'd actually been losing members. 
at the time when they made the transition, and uh, they're over. I believe they're over 500 now. Uh, so there's still a relatively small number of members for, to support a successful co-op, but it's at least a huge improvement and very respectable. They they raised two hundred thousand dollars in member loans from those members to do this transition. By the way, so uh, even you know, when there's when there's commitment, there's money. Great, thanks. Okay. All right, and then the last example. Um, this is a store that I'm very fond of. I love their story. I love their manager. She's very supportive of our work, for one thing. I've got to love that. But Common Ground in Champaign-Urbana was one of those other stores. They, they actually started out as a buying club in 1974, and 10 years later opened their first retail space, 900 square feet. And they did a little better than average in that small space, uh, even, but, you know, we're looking at from 1984 to 2008, they still only gotten up to $650,000 in retail sales. And now we're talking about a metropolitan area of 120,000 people. Uh, clearly, there is a gap between what they were performing at and what should have been potential. And they had some transitions in management and in leadership that said, "Let's look at this. Let's maybe it's time we do something." They got a professional market study, and they went ahead and went into a new store. Um, now, they're still a small store at 2,150 square feet, definitely small, uh, more than twice what they had. But look what happened just in the first year to their sales volume. And I, clearly, there's untapped need when you can see that kind of growth, from 650,000 to 1.9 million, more than three times the sales. Uh, and in a couple more years, that grew to 3.9 million. And now, 3.9 million in uh, 2,150 square feet is eight, over $1,800 per square foot annual basis, and that is a superb number for any store to achieve. Uh, anything over 1,000 square feet is very good, and in some cases, you start running into crowded aisle syndrome. Um, or what we like to call the butt bump factor when you get much above $1,000 a square foot. So there, they've, in just a few years, four years, they've outgrown their expansion. And they went ahead in 2012 and expanded again, this time to about 5,700 square feet. Uh, and uh, they haven't finished their first fiscal year. They're projecting 7.2 million, more than double again. So right-sizing the store, clearly it cost a lot less to open that store and run it, but by the same token, the market was there for the very large, or the much larger store, and it's still not a very large store at 5,700 square feet of retail. Now, when I asked for some information from uh, Jacqueline. Jacqueline Hanna is the woman in the blue uh, shirt in the picture on the left. She's their general manager. She gave me some uh, a few sentences about the project that I think are really illuminating, and if you'll bear with me, I'm going to quote her. So Jacqueline had to say is that when we built our new store in 2008, Bill Gessner, a professional consultant, and our market study both said our community could support a 10,000 square foot store with 6,000 square feet of retail space. We were not able to raise enough funds to make a space that large a reality in 2008, and while we've been a success in the smaller space, we built to such a degree that we were able to uh, expand our space to the full-size grocery store we'd hoped to build in 2008. It has cost us in the community. The reality is that doing two separate expansions costs a great deal more money than creating the whole space at 2008 costs. Construction costs go up significantly every year. What could Common Ground now be capable of if we could have made the move to a full service store from the start? How much money could have been saved for other initiatives? How much more prepared would we be now for major competition if it moved into our market? We'll never know for sure, and we're very lucky that we've been able to continue to grow fast to become the size our community really needed from the start to serve the potential of the community. But if I could go back to 2008 and fight a little harder to get our store to full service size the first time around, I would do it in a heartbeat. 
being too small postponed thousands of community members finding out about Common Ground and slowed the growth of our mission in the community. So, I mean, I couldn't have said it better myself. I mean, the reason you want to get the store the right size, you'll ultimately serve more people more effectively, and it's a lot cheaper than growing step by step. Thank you, Jacqueline. Okay. All right. We'll move on one more slide here. And it's back to check in with Goldilocks. So finding that just right, what do you have to do? Well, you start with your vision. You have to know what you want, and it has to be clear. And don't let go of it when going gets rough. Uh, the fact that it's gotten harder to find new members, that it's been harder to find money than you thought, isn't a reason to say, I'm not going to open the store that this community needs. I'm going to open something they only half need, and it'll only be half successful because I've lost half my vision. A bad choice. The market study is your friend. The only way to know for sure what any given community is capable of doing to support a, a new store is with a well-run market study. And I always recommend that you use a professional and use somebody that's familiar with co-ops and natural food if you're going to have a natural food store. Uh, otherwise, we've seen some really poor results from people that did it as a sideline or, or weren't that familiar with the market they were working in. So feasibility research is being realistic about what your potential is, not for sales volume, but for the store to be viable. And that means that you have to have access to the kind of food you want to sell. You have to have a, a potentially at least a good site for it. You might not have chosen that early on, but you, you need to have options. You need to have a workforce available that can support and run a store. It takes a lot of skills to run a modern grocery. And you have to have a community that will support it, both financially and by shopping there. Some of those things you can begin to look at and think about without any professional help at all. Uh, the last piece of the feasibility research, of course, is do the numbers work? And that means doing a fairly complicated set of projections that prove out that with the sales volume that's projected, and the expenses that you will incur to make a, build a store of a certain size, that you can be profitable within a time period that will allow you to um, survive if you're losing money in the first year or two, which is normal for a new store. So th that's all part of feasibility. But that's without those two pieces, without knowing your sales projection and without knowing whether your business plan can support that store financially, you really are shooting in the dark. Other ways to help find the right, just right. Community survey, I think you can learn a lot from a community survey. I think you can tell the community a lot by putting out a survey. Uh, but I don't think that you necessarily can judge everything accurately because people are so often when they get surveys, they, they answer the way they think you want them to. and their behavior may not follow suit to what they say they'll do. For many people will say that, oh, I would shop 50% of the time at the co-op. And of those, 50% of them will shop at the co-op 25% of the time. Um, or it could be better than that. But those are the kinds of things that you have to watch out for if you base too much on a community survey. And finally, um, we touched on this. The right size store won't make a darn bit of difference if it's not in the right place. Uh, it's hugely important to the success of any retail business. And picking a site because it's available without further consideration of its attributes is, is one way that a lot of new co-ops have gotten in trouble. So it's very, very important that you do the site selection carefully. All right, let's take the next one here. Hey, Stuart. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Bethlehem Co-op, and they wanted to know, what would you recommend as the first steps for a site selection committee? Well, I, I would say that I would hope that they have had that background information collected. So that, that you have a sales projection, and you have, some, you have a vision of what your store is going to be, what kind of product mix, who you're serving. Um, then the next step would probably be, uh, you know, keeping your eyes open. Most most co-ops make the mistake of trying to 
lock down a site too early in the process before they're really prepared. And a lot of things change quickly in real estate. So you, you don't want to start leasing a site two years before you're ready to move in. You'll go broke paying rent. Um, most landlords won't hold it for you for an extended time period. So the time to start looking seriously is usually when you're halfway through the second stage of feasibility and planning. You've got uh, at least uh, you've got your, your uh, sales projections. You might have done some of your business plan. You're getting ready to, you've got a sizable membership and you're thinking about how you're going to organize your cap, main capital campaign, member loans, bank loans, and everything else that will pay the bills. You're at that point, it's time to look at sites. And the members of the committee, probably through word of mouth and driving around and whatever, will come across a few. Uh, a lot of co-ops will work with a real estate uh, broker or realtor and ask them you know, to help them find locations that are suitable. Mm -hmm. Mixed results. Sometimes it works quite well. They, can find, they have good findings and sometimes they don't. Sometimes people in the business community or in the civic community that, have, that, that will know about potential sites that are available that the city or community may have an interest in, in seeing a good economic anchor there. So you, you want to look at all those sources. Uh, talk to people a lot. Use your networks. Um, don't jump too quickly. Uh, there's a lot of things about a site that have to be considered from parking to road access to how hard it's going to be to remodel. Uh, to, you know, the right amount of space is only one of the concerns, but it's critical. And a lot of times, if you can, having the person who did your market study evaluate potential sites is a, is a wise choice. They're, they're going to know what to look for. They're going to give you an unbiased opinion of why one site might be better than another. And probably even uh, the better market researchers will tell, give you modified sales projections based on the characteristics of each of those sites. Um, now, if you had your market study done a while back and you weren't looking at sites yet, you might have gotten some general feedback. A lot of the ideal, ideally, you would pay a little more to have that researcher come back and look at the specific sites that you're considering. The site selection is that critical that it's worth paying for it. Um, I can't emphasize that enough. Mm -hmm. Great, and um, Tyler just was curious to know if, if you, um, with FCI or CDS Consulting, which is another co-op consulting group, have design templates for different um, size spaces. We don't. Um, it's an interesting idea, and I think if you looked at floor plans for stores, you would see an awful lot of similarities in different sizes. Um, however, there's also so many unique characteristics. Buildings aren't, don't come in uniform rectangles by any means. Um, some of them are long and skinny, some of them are square. I've even got one co-op that's in a round building. And they're using a pie-shaped wedge out of it to make it even more fun. And they're doing it very successful, by the way. So it's really hard to do a, a standard template. I do think that the best approach to that uh, it, it has lots of benefits, is to look at other co-ops. I mean, physically, just go in there, walk them, get a sense of how they feel, what you like, what you don't like. Uh, if you can visit a few, few co-ops of different sizes, or if you already know about the size you're going to be, a few co-ops near that size, and see how they do things differently. Don't be afraid to ask questions. Co-ops are very friendly places. Ask them, how does this work for you? What do you like about your space? What would you do different? I think that's that's going to give you a lot of insights, more so even than a, probably a template would. But I would say also that if you hire a professional store planner, they can probably share some examples of other layouts that they've done to give you a sense of what you can do with a certain store size. I'm not going to promise that, but I think they would. Okay. So we have our second fairy tale now, the three little pigs, and. Um, they're just going to give us some, a brief overview here of one of the cons, one of the reasons why I think uh, I like you know, small stores and large stores. Anybody can do poor planning, believe me, and we've seen it at both large and small. But often the idea that the small store is going to be easier and quicker tends to lead people toward uh, shortcuts and. 
you know, the house of straws, it's quick and easy, uh, we'll throw it up and uh, move in right away. Yeah, okay, well, is it going to last is the question. Uh, if you've got a wolf in the, in, on your uh, tail, it won't. And even the store that you take a little more time and, and attention to, but leave out a few things, it doesn't take much to skip, to leave that vulnerability again and the wolf is back at your door. So when you're planning and executing, pay attention to the details. They do matter. Don't skip over major steps in the, in the process and uh, you, know, you can roast the wolf instead of being eaten. Now, in the, the grim fairy tales really are grim, by the way, if you've ever read the originals, so no apologies for that. Okay, moving right along. We've talked a lot about small stores, and the reason I'm talking so much time on small stores is because that is where I think most organizing groups tend to have trouble understanding why they shouldn't do it, and why, where we're most often encouraging people to think bigger. Uh, there's even more reasons than I've given you now. You'll find that there's a lot more support available for you in a larger store than there is in a small store because you can afford it in some cases because you're aligned with existing larger stores and their kind of operation. If you're doing something so different from them that they're not familiar with it, they aren't going to be able to help you. But what if that small store is your only option? You're Yelm, Washington. You've got 7,000 people. Um, how big, you know, you've got a choice. We're going to open a store. It's going to be small, probably. Just be sure you follow the plan, like I said before. Don't skip the details. Very careful business planning. Think about ways that your operating expenses can be brought down, because that's usually what where the differential is in a small store. Their, their operating expenses are too high relative to their revenue. Can you get a reduced rent? Can you get, will it last for the length of your tenancy or is it going to be just for the first year? Uh, if you, are you pretty sure you're not going to have a major competitor coming into town or contrarily that your local independently run grocery store owner isn't going to retire leaving you the only operation in town? That happens a lot these days. Uh, and boy, you better make sure you've got a great site. Uh, if you're going to rely on that low sales volume, you've got to have everything in your in your favor. Uh, taking a, a cheap but inadequate site will not solve the problem. Uh, so you may or may not be able to do any of those things in terms of reducing expenses, but that's where the business plan comes back in the picture. Run the numbers. This is what our rent's going to be. This is what our costs are going to be to build out the store, to put in inventory. This is what our operating budget is going to look like if we have paid staff or how many paid staff. Uh, can we be profitable? Can we at least break even? You, you, you don't, don't guess that. You have to do a well thought out budget both for the opening and for operations, looking out several years in the future if not five or ten. And finally, there are communities that probably can't support a co-op, and that is the harsh reality. I, you know, it's, it's not what we want to tell anybody, and sometimes it's hard to know what size that is. So some communities of 10 or 15,000 might not support a co-op. Other communities of 7,000 can support a million-dollar co-op. Another community of 18,000 can support a fifteen or $5 million co-op. But it will depend on the nature of the community, the, you know, the people in it, what they want to spend their money on, and the kind of co-op that you build for them. So uh, is anything possible? Well, not anything, but a lot of things are if you do your business planning right. <clears throat> I think that's starting to sound like a theme. All right, finally, one more slide here. Yes, there's the theme again in the moral of the story. Use good business plans, get professional advice, build the right sized co-op to start with if you possibly can, and final slide, you get to live happily ever after. So there we have it. And uh, we have a few minutes left for some follow-up questions. What do we have? 
Yes, here we have um, another question here from JD, and he asks, would you recommend a separate set of groups or committees to keep members involved or to prevent interference by major competitors? Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure what is meant by the part about the major interference from major competitors, but I, I, we would recommend that you have uh, probably a group, a committee of volunteers, whatever, and possibly representation from the board or steering committee. Working with member engagement and member communication is one of the most important things you're going to be doing as a volunteer organizing group. That's something you can do, and you need to do it as effectively as possible and as consistently as possible. And uh, that might that means holding people accountable, training people to do the job well, but using as much communication as you can, both to the people that are already members and the community as a whole, to get them interested and aware of something that may be kind of uh, exotic or strange to a lot of people that aren't familiar with co-ops. Always keeping in mind that there are always a core group of people that will support your co-op, that understand it, that get it, that love it, that will put their money in the hat right away. And then there's a whole lot more people that have differing levels of understanding and commitment. And they have to be part of this if it's going to work. You can't do it just with that inner core, very rarely anyway. So that communication effort has to be diverse, thoughtful, and it, it's really a, quite a talent to do it very well, but it's going to be very important to your project. So that's that's an area by itself that deserves a lot of attention. And the part about uh, holding off potential competitors, I think, I'm not sure where you were going with that, but what I would say is that you want to, anytime you're doing anything that is potentially uh, of advantage for a competitor to know, be careful about how you how much of that you release publicly. You don't have to tell everything to your members. Mm -hmm. uh, that is not implied by the fact that we're a member-owned business. Um, for example, a very easy example, it's illegal to talk about personnel issues. It, you, you can't share that. Um, on the other hand, talking about real estate transactions is just really risky. Uh, not only could a potential competitor say, oh, they're interested in that site. I didn't notice that. That looks great. But there's also the possibility that the landlord will say, oh, they like our site. I guess we don't have to negotiate as much. They'll right. come to us and pay what we want. So you don't want to talk a lot about your real estate until you've got a signed document, whether it's a contingent lease or a final lease. And you also probably don't want to share your any details, if, if anything, from your market study that talks about sales potential and, and siting. That's tough because your members will want to know what that says. So we usually just suggest that you give general general outline of it. Um, we have sales potential of two to four million dollars, depending on where we site, and we have some recommendations we'll be investigating. Um, your situation may differ, where letting out a little more information doesn't seem to put you at risk. You have to make that call, but we don't recommend you share a lot of that. Got anything else for me, Susie? I think we are. We are at 3 o'clock right now. All right. Well, as always, we're happy to um, have you contact us after the fact. Um, you know, if you go to our website, www.foodcoopinitiative.coop, there's a contact us button and lots of other information, and you can ask a question anytime. We're happy to try to help you. So thanks, everybody, for coming today. I hope we see you again next month, and uh, go open a good call.